How many of you can name more than two women who appear in the Vedas as scholars? How many of you have heard of Albert Einstein? <laughs> How many of you have heard of Emmy Noether again before you saw this title? That's my point. There are lots of women, seekers of knowledge, equal partners in knowledge, who deserve to be known much beyond what they are known today. Let me mention some other names from the Vedic times, Lopamudra, Ghosha, Gargi. Maitreyi stands out amongst all of them. She was a Brahmavadini, seeker of knowledge, passionate seeker of knowledge and a seer amongst men, equal among men. The odds against women have always been stacked very high in most of the fields, including academia. Cambridge University didn't open its doors to women as equal partners until 1947. The governance structures completely excluded women until 1920. And though women were allowed to attend examinations, courses, take exams, before that, the degree that was given to them was not a degree, but a diploma. The fellows of the fellowship of the Royal Society started in 1662. The first woman member was admitted in 1945. The French Academy began in 1666. The first woman was admitted in 1962. Contrast this with SNDT Women's University, which was started in Bombay, 1896, by Keshav Karve. It was revolutionary at that time, but unfortunately not as transformational as it could have been. The point I want to make is the following. Networks are important. It's recognized today that formation of peer networks begins you know, already at a very young age, and just as we had heard in the previous talk, plays a very important role in the formation of a person. And this networking has excluded women and continues to exclude women to a certain extent in academia. Let me start with mentioning some of the names who have flourished, who have thrived in science in spite of this exclusion. Mary Curie in the 20th century, to prove herself, she won two Nobel Prizes, and if that was not enough, produced a daughter who won one. <laughs> Dorothy Hodgkin from Cambridge won the Nobel Prize in 1964 for her path-breaking work in X-ray crystallography and understanding protein structures, notably that of insulin. Rosalind Franklin, again, for understanding the molecular structure of DNA. How many of you know that there was a woman who played the same role, or probably a greater role, than Frat Watson and Crick in understanding the structure of the DNA? Not many. Very few, and these are stories that we need to spread. Let me come to some, uh, some more names going back in time. 18th century, Sophie Germain. She was a French mathematician, entirely self-taught, learned everything from the books in her father's library, corresponded with the most famous scientists, especially mathematicians of that age, under a pseudonym, a male pseudonym. Many of them were later totally taken by surprise when they realized that they had been corresponding with a woman and not a man. She laid the foundations of elasticity theory. She was recognized by the French Academy later on. Sophie Germain has a special class of prime numbers named after her called the Sophie Germain primes. A lot of study going on in those primes even today. She was granted a posthumous honorary degree, rather grudgingly, one would think, from Göttingen University. <coughs> and now I come to this extraordinary woman, Emmy Noether, who was born in 1882. She was born into a family of academics. Her father was an academic. Her brother also later turned to be an academic. But she was an extraordinary scientist, an extraordinary woman mathematician, who deserves to be far, far well known than she is today not just among the girls, which is very important, but also among the general public. She studied unofficially at Göttingen, could never secure an official position because of her gender, in spite of peer recognition. Now, that's an area where she did not fail. All the greatest minds which were in Göttingen math department at that time, Felix Klein, David Hilbert, these are names that are revered in mathematics, they all acknowledged her talent, they all acknowledged her penetrating mind, her insights in mathematics, and so on and tried hard to argue with the administration to give her a job. In fact, David Hilbert is supposed to have said, I do not see the sex of the candidate in an argument against her. After all, we are a university, not a bathhouse. <laughs> Passionate about math, unconcerned about material accoutrements, she moved, marched ahead in her work, laid the foundations of abstract algebra, and people 
whatever we do today in algebra today in the field of mathematics, we owe almost everything to Amy Noether and her group. She was extremely generous. She had a group of students working under her, absolutely generous in sharing her ideas, mentoring them, and being acknowledged by her peers, which was very gratifying, though I don't think she really cared. And then there was Nazi Germany, and all her mathematical stature couldn't come to her rescue, and she moved to Bryn Mawr in 1933 in the United States. This is a picture of Isfahan Mosque. And what I want you to notice here is the symmetry. That's what is beautiful about maths. You see unexpected patterns, linkages in this image. Study of mathematics, especially deep research in mathematics, throws up such unexpected patterns and interlinkages, which as a practitioner of mathematics, you cannot help but stand back and admire. That's why we talk about the beauty of mathematics, the aesthetics of mathematics. The way things perfectly fit together when you're searching for a solution for long and then finally you see the doors open. I like to make the following comparison between a physicist and a mathematician. A physicist is trying to guess what's behind the closed doors. Whereas a mathematician who knows the intrinsic nature of mathematics and so on and sees patterns knows what's behind the door and is trying to prove that it's correct. Noether gave a mathematical meaning to symmetry. And this was at a time when Albert Einstein had just formulated his special theory, of general theory of relativity. There were still some very vexing issues that hadn't been solved, in particular, some questions relating to energy conservation. And the group in Göttingen, which, like I said, consisted of the greatest mathematical minds, they were very excited about Einstein's work, and they were trying to understand what he had written and also trying to come to terms with some of the problems that were unresolved. And Emmy Noether took upon this task with her group. She started reading the papers and very quickly saw the mathematical foundations, deep penetrating insights, which led her to formulate the connection between mathematics, what she was working in, the concept of symmetry that occurred to her, which David Hilbert was also working with at that time, and what Einstein was trying to put together, you know, some of the issues that were not resolved. This today goes under the name of Noether's theorem, and what it says roughly is what symmetry is to mathematics translates itself as conservation laws in physics. It's a beautiful theorem. You can talk to any mathematician or any physicist who understands that, and they can't but help marvel at its simplicity, at the unity that she brought for these two diverse subjects. That's one of the beauties of mathematics. It's, you know, all her peers, including Einstein, was aghast at her penetrating insight, and this helped the subject in that nascent stage proceed further. And not, no, not many people know this story, you know. And it's a beautiful story which somehow completes the whole picture that Einstein was trying to create. Hermann Weyl, another seminal mathematician of that time, was the one who first said, math is beautiful, and he called it a poetry of logical ideas. And Noether's theorem, like I mentioned, is something that brings home this point very well. And I often think that Maitreyi and Noether, especially when you read the exchanges between Maitreyi and her companion, Yagnya Valkya, I can't help but think that the two women would have got along greatly together had they been able to network. I also want to bring your attention at this point to a wonderful book that's brought out by the Indian Academy of Sciences called Leelavati's Daughters. This contains accounts of um, numerous Indian women scientists talking about their work. And what amazes me each time I read that book is the passion with which all of them speak for their work that they are doing in different areas of science. <coughs> Humankind has grappled, I again come back to abstract mathematics, humankind has grappled with problems since time immo immemorial. There's a very old Babylonian tablet going back to around 3000 BC where they are trying to understand more about numbers, more about solving equations and so on. Of course, today you can translate it in that language, but it's clear that that's what they are approaching. And there are mathematical ideas today which underpin many of these uh, diverse areas. And perhaps the most easiest one to communicate is number theory, where you can easily state the problems because all of us are familiar with numbers and use them on a daily basis. But let me warn you, not numerology, it's number theory. So, Prime numbers, these have always been mysterious, continue to be mysterious. People have studied it for 5,000 years and there are still innumerable problems that are open. And the sheer beauty, the mystery and the magic is what keeps mathematicians going to try and understand these problems to get in further on. You know. 
And let me also not, um, <coughs> let me now underline the power of abstraction. So coming back to this, this is a series of prime numbers between 2 and 10 to the power um, 8. And there's a millionth prime that is listed there. And the power of abstraction, which is one of the hallmarks of mathematics, that's what, again, attracts many people to mathematics. It might seem dry to many, but for those practitioners of pure mathematics, abstraction has its own beauty, and the power of abstraction cannot be underestimated. I don't know how many of you know the story, but it was pure thought that helped a mathematician called Nicely some 20 years back to find a flaw in the Intel chip. Intel, at first, did not admit it, but later when they found that his theorizing was correct, they had to go back to the drawing room and do the checking, and indeed there was a flaw. And so the power of abstract thought or the human brain against computer today is still something that's obvious to a practicing mathematician. So today math is making inroads into different areas. One can argue, perhaps, that the recent Nobel Prize in Physics is really a prize for mathematics. CERN, the agency, the Swiss agency, and the Large Hydron Collider spent billions of dollars trying to verify what a mathematician, Peter Higgs, just needed a pen and paper to conjecture many years back to theorize about. And that's the beauty of mathematics. Again, the insights that one can gain by working with abstraction and in setting right the whole pattern or the whole system of thought together to see the structures fall into place. And math, like I said, is making inroads today into different areas. Not many of us are aware of it, but there's math in your mobile phone. There's math in the imaging equipment that you use. There is math in the transportation that you used to get here today, be it an automobile or uh, an airplane. And this is perhaps what Galileo knew years back in the 16th century when he exhorted people to learn mathematics. He said, learn math, learn math. Mathematics is the language with which God has written the universe. Here's a quote from Plato, the great Greek philosopher, who says arithmetic has a very great and elevating effect. He said mathematics differentiates somebody from being and becoming. That was the kind of importance he gave. He was perhaps a bit extreme. He wanted everybody in the Republic to be punished if they did anything other than mathematics and poetry. <laughs> so it is this power of abstraction that attracted me to mathematics and continues to fascinate me and continues to attract me. I grew up in a family which was not um, academic in the sense there were no academics, but my grandmother was a great source of inspiration. Her curiosity and her interest in learning was something that she instilled in me and my brother. And all her life, her lament was that she was not educated. And she made us feel that we should not let this opportunity go by, and you should fully use the opportunity that we have in front of us when we are being educated. I've been fortunate to work in two great places, TIFR Bombay and correctly, currently the University of British Columbia. And one of the things I love about the University of British Columbia is its diversity, both in terms of national, international diversity and also gender diversity. And it gives me a great pleasure when I see the women students come up to me and talk to me about questions, ask me questions much more uh, in a forthright fashion than they would have were they a male uh, professor. I feel it's this kind of role models and this kind of networking that's important for women to get noticed and to get interested and to be confident in practicing whatever they're doing, not just science. And that is, again, something that's not completely in place, even in academia. Women were, after all, primeval teachers. All of us learned the lessons of life on, our, on the laps of our mothers. I've heard fascinating stories from some of my students about how their mothers taught them the alphabet or drawing with whatever there was from remote rural communities, with whatever uh, little they had, like piles of sand or food grains that they were working with and so on. And we know that women excel academically up to high school, and most of us have been taught by female teachers, women teachers, but then there's suddenly a leakage and there's a big hole at the top when it comes to actual practitioners in science. We need to set that right. This calls for change of mindset, change of policy. A simple act like opening a daycare in TIFR transformed the workplace for women and got so many of uh, husband and wife couples coming back to India and wanting to work in TIFR. And I want to 
tell you something else that I see parallels with. In the 9th century, in Hei in Japan, there was an absolute flowering of women's literature. Women were not educated, they were excluded from education, but most of them somehow managed to sneakily learn the alphabet when their brothers, who were not so intelligent, were being taught. And then went on to produce the most amazing forms of poetry and literature, which has survived the test of time, and which continues to excite and exhilarate people from around the world in the Japanese studies departments and also novices till today. And at that time, the discourse in society, this was also the time that Buddhism came to Japan, and the discourse in society was whether women were fit enough to enter the portals of heaven. <laughs> so uh, I want to close my uh, talk with this, young, with this image of uh, three groups of young women who won various awards. As you can see, the young scientist, Google young, UK young scientist, Google young scientist, and the Intel Iris 2010 competition winners from India, Purnima and Nandini. I don't want you to get the impression that this was something for women. Women competed as equals with men and won the top slots. And I'm sure, and what is, what's, what's so heartening when you read about them is the passion with which all of them speak about what, the, what they did, the projects that won them the prizes. I'm sure Kirtana and uh, Sri Bose will go on to do great work, but already Purnima and Nandini have fallen off the higher education map in India. How do we ensure that that does not happen? We are trying to build something called the Gyanom, which is a digital uh, resource, and I want people to share and contribute to this Gyandan. Let me stop here. Thank you.